give honor and praise unto our God and to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it's always a blessing and privilege uh, to enter into the house of worship and to take sweet counsel together. Amen. Amen. I love how David describes uh, this time as taking sweet counsel. I mean, oh, the, sweet, the word is sweet. Amen. Amen. And it's not so much sweet from what he communicates. It's sweet because it's his word. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Whenever, whenever you hear the word of God, it should be a sweetness to your own. So I love that text in Ezekiel 2. When Ezekiel eats the scroll and it says it's sweet to his soul. He, the message that he received was a vile message of judgment and woe. And when he eats it and digests it, he says it's sweet to his soul. And I suggest that it was sweet not because of what was revealed to him. It was sweet because it was God's word. God's word, when God speaks to us every, every Sunday, every Lord's Day, we, I, I hope we view it as sweet. Amen? Amen. Thank God, uh, you, uh, Jaquay and Micaiah, for exhorting us this morning through song. Uh, if you have your Bibles, could you turn with me to Ezekiel 24, uh, verses 1 through 14. I'm, I'm going to try my best to squeeze two more sermons out of this book of Ezekiel and put a bow on it. Hopefully by the first Sunday when we have our first united worship service together, I will be on a different theme and subject. Amen? Uh, and then we will come back to Ezekiel at some other moment, at some other time, to address the subject of restoration and hope. First 24 chapters of, of Ezekiel, sin and judgment. The last chapters of Ezekiel are about restoration and hope. Amen. Ezekiel 24, verses 1 through 4. And before I do that, let me read, I have, uh, open up with God's word, a prayer. Uh, we thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity and privilege to open up your word and to preach your word today. We pray, Lord, that you would continue, Lord, to give us grace. Lord, we can't do anything without your wisdom and without your strength. We are totally inept. We don't have the capacity on our own to fulfill our calling and mission on without your grace. It's only so much that I can do and I am inadequate for the task. I can faithfully proclaim that only you can renew the heart. Amen. Only you, Lord, can produce real conviction and contrition and give real comfort and hope through your word. So we are utterly dependent upon you, Lord God, to as the word is faithfully declared, ensure that it does not return unto you void, that it accomplishes everything that you sent it forth to do. We ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, write thee the name of the day. Even this same day, the king of Babylon setteth himself against Jerusalem the same day and uttered a parable unto the rebellious house and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, set on a pot, set it on, and also pour, pour water into it. Gather the pieces thereof into it, even every good piece, the thigh, the shoulder, fill it with the choice bones. Take the choice of the flock and burn it also, the bones under it, and make it boil well. And let them see the bones of it therein. Wherefore thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein, whose scum is not gone out of it. Bring it out piece by piece. Let no lot fall upon it, for her blood is in the midst of her. She set it upon the top of a rock. She poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust, that it might cause fury to come up to take vengeance. I have set her blood upon the top of a rock, that it should not be covered. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city. I will even make the power for fire great. Keep on wood, kindle the fire, consume the flesh, and spice it well, and let the bones be burned. Then set it empty upon the coals thereof, that the brass of it may be hot, 
and may burn, and that the filthiness of it may be molten in it, that the scum of it may be consumed. She hath wearied herself with lies, and her great scum went not forth out of her. Her scum shall be in the fire, and thy filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged. Thou wast not be purged from thy filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. Neither will I spare. Neither will I repent according to thy ways and according to thy doings. Shall they judge thee, saith the Lord God. Again, looking at that 13th verse, and in thy filthiness is lewdness because I have purged thee and thou wast not purged, thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. I would like to use this morning as a subject from which to preach the propitious power of God. You may be seated in the presence of God. The propitious power of God. The term propitious is the idea, and it really captures the idea of a God who is at odds with humanity. And he is, he is reconciled with this wicked and evil humanity. The idea is that there is an offended God and there is, and there are an offending people. And there is no peace between them. And in order to accomplish that peace, some propitiation, some peace offering must be made. For us, we understand that the peace offering that was to be made for our reconciliation with God, who has been offended by our wickedness and our own wretchedness, is the offering of the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That that virtuous blood, that offering, that sacrifice is what saves us. I remember coming up and I knew how I was as a young man, as a young Christian, struggling with my own sanctification at times. And I would go to church and I would hear the songs about the propitious power of God. And they would flood my soul and bring me joy. I was in the Kojic church, they would say there's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And my grandfather would sing his favorite, one of his favorite hymns was, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What? can make me whole again, nothing but the blood, the blood of Jesus. All precious is the flow that makes us white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. All of these songs were here to encourage and to challenge us to see the propitious power of God. How, we, how God makes peace with an offended, wicked people. And that message was constantly pushed in us by the songs we sung. In worship, amen. That's why I got a problem with so much worship today because they, they're bloodless songs. They're songs that don't show us and communicate the richness of God's grace to us in Christ. We would sing, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And I love that course that says the dying thief yeah. rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. Yeah. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Yeah. All these songs were about the propitious power of God, the power of the blood to cleanse us and to reconcile us with a God who's been offended by our own wretchedness and through our wickedness, church. We don't sing about those songs anymore. 
These songs are not a part of our repertoire in the morning services. We don't talk about God's propitiation, his power to purge us and to purify us, to cleanse us of all of our wretchedness, not through our own merit, but through the merit of his own son. How many know the blood still has power? In fact, we would sing another song we would say about the blood. It said it will never lose its power. Amen. It says the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. We would sing, it soothes my doubts and it calms all of my fears. I don't know about you, it, it, it dries all of my tears. The blood that gives me strength, and then it would say this, not at the moment of conversion, it meant somebody. The blood is just not for us when we get saved, but from day to day. The blood that gives me strength every day, from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the, to the lowest valley. How many of you have ever been, been in the valley before? Wherever you were at when the Lord found you. Amen, somebody. You were not on a righteous mountain. You were in the dregs of your unrighteousness and the blood of Christ found you there and it saved you. How many of you know of God's redeeming power? That God redeems us in spite of us through the precious blood of his son. And I think that's what the, the gist of these verses are about. This text this morning really unpacks the idea of how God, when Israel would return back to the homeland after his judgment, how they would find favor and how their real fortunes would be restored again. Amen, somebody. And how many know that when, we, when, when Adam sinned in, in the garden, we lost our fortune. Amen. And the only way that our fortune is restored again is through the mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Whenever you have time, when you have time this, this evening, go read Ephesians 2. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 2 says that by, 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 by through one man, through Jesus Christ, by his blood, he has made peace with God. Amen, somebody. Amen. We have peace with God through the blood of Christ. His blood has propitious power. It makes a wrathful, vengeful God our friend. Amen. You know, only, only the Christian can call God their friend. Do you know that apart from salvation in Christ, you are not a friend of God? The Bible says you are an enemy of God. Amen, somebody. That God's Wrath, his righteousness, his holiness is set against you. Amen, somebody. And the only way that you are brought into a favorable condition is by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Through him, you are brought into a position where God is now to be called your friend. He's your friend. Christ Jesus is your great patron. The Christian in this life is never friendless. We always have a friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. All my sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. That we have a God who meets us in our frailty, who meets us in our frustrations. We have a Savior. We have a friend. We have another friendless. We shouldn't walk around with our heads down and miss somebody. I love that song again that says, Why should I feel discouraged? And why should, 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 should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? <laughs> it says, a constant friend is he. Uh, some of our, our old friends, y'all old friends, they fickle. Amen. Amen, somebody. Amen. We have some fickle and funny friends, but Christ Jesus is a constant friend. And in fact, the Bible says he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And he watches over the sparrow. I know. <laughs> I know he watches me. How many know he watching over you this, this morning? You are never alone. You're never by yourself. You found in Christ. You found in God a helper. Amen, somebody. That's why I will not fear what men can do to me. I know that God is my helper. I've had people let me down, 
But when they let me down, God was always there to bear me up. When men forsake you, then the, the, the Lord, the, the Lord will take you up. Has that ever happened to you before? Have you ever found people say, I'll be with you through thick and thin? And when that thin starts getting thick, they, they, they know where to be found. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. You, you used to call them, you used to be able to get them on the first ring. Now you're getting their voicemail. Yeah. Amen, somebody. <laughs> they don't want to pick up. But you have a friend yeah. in Jesus. Yeah. Amen. We were seeing coming up, Jesus is on the main line. Yeah. <laughs> tell him what you want. If you're sick and you want to get well, tell him what you want. If, if you need you, your soul saying, tell him what your Christ is always there to hear the cries of his people. He's a great friend to us. Now this morning I want to consider this subject, the subject under the three headings this morning. First we'll look at God's anger visited on his people. And then we'll look secondly at how Israel fanned the flames of God's anger. And then we'll look at satisfying God's righteous judgment. Those three things I want to consider this morning. First, God's anger visited on his people. Secondly, how Israel fanned the flames of God's anger. And then third, satisfy, satisfying God's righteous judgment. When you read the Bible... God's anger would be expressed upon his people through the Babylonian siege under Nebuchadnezzar II. The Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar and his army would come upon Jerusalem as a stronghold. And this fence fortified city in that day, its walls would not stand firm. The armies of Babylon would come into Jerusalem, leaving nothing but destruction in their wake. It would be an utter day of de devastation. In fact, the Bible says on that day, even righteous women and men and children would be killed. No one would, would be spared. Everyone would die on that day. They would fall victim by the hand of the sword. And this is God's providential judgment upon his disobedient nation. That God is raining down his wrath and fury on his own people. His covenant people. It would be a day of utter despair. Every heart would melt. No one would be able to stand on that day. This, was, again, was an outward expression of God's anger on his people. If we look at verses 1 and 2, we see that this event is dated by the years of King Jehoiakim's captivity in Babylon. King Jehoiakim was Israel's last king. There was this 19th king of Israel, and he was the grandson of Josiah. And this Babylonian siege has really taken almost a hundred years to accomplish. But this was the ninth year and the tenth month of Jehoiakim's captivity on that very day. The prophet Ezekiel is told to tell the nation of Israel in Babylon that Jerusalem was being sieged. The armies of, Jer of Babylon were invading Jerusalem on that very day. As I march by this point, let, 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 let me say this. Hear me and hear me well. There's going to come a dreadful day of judgment for all humanity. It's going to come on a day. It's going to come on a day of the Lord's appearing. And beloved, we should, we should not look, we should detest this sorrowful day because on that day, Men who have, who have forsaken Christ, who have refused to turn to him on that day, they're going to face the wrath of God in his fullness. You think this was something. What Israel faced, that's small. That's small. That wrath was, was, was only a, a picture of the real wrath. It was a forerunner of the real wrath that is to come. 
come upon all humanity at the day on the day of the Lord's return. The Lord is coming back. And this time when he comes back, he's not going to come back as a humble lamb. He's going to come back as a conquering king and judge. The Bible says he's going to be riding on a white horse and on his best that he's going to have king of kings and lord of lords. He's not coming to, 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 to bring salvation through, through the cross. He's bringing to bring judgment upon those who refused his gracious overtures. Amen, somebody. Israel has fallen upon under God's fury. And the way that the prophet Ezekiel marks the day is by Jehokim's, the years of Jehokim's captivity. Look at verses 1 and 2. Again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, write thee the name of the day. Even of this same day, the king of Babylon sets himself against Jerusalem this same day. Prophet Ezekiel is given a, a, a special function. His job is to illustrate, to utter, to, to demonstrate by parable, by sign, how this would happen. Remember that Ezekiel is his, 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 his prophecies were very enigmatic and dramatic. In one instance, in chapter 11, he, 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 he predicts, he, he prophesies and illustrates how Israel would be carried into captivity. God asked Ezekiel, Ezekiel, get up and pack your bags. And I want you to pack your bags before the eyes of the people and maybe this rebellious nation would consider what's happening. I want you to put your stuff in the ground and I want you to act like you're being carried away into bondage. And here in this text, he gives another dramatic illustration of what would happen to the people. And he illustrates it by saying that God will have a cooking pot. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Better yet, not a cooking pot, a crucible or a furnace. And the people of Israel, those who occupy the king and the people, they are the precious metal that, that will be consumed under the fire of God's indignation. They will be put in the pot because they will be melted under the fire of God's indignation. No, no one says carefully about them. Look at verse number four. Gather thee the pieces thereof into it, even every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with the choice bones, take the choice of the flock, and burn also the bones of, under it, and make it boil, and let them see the bones of it therein. For this reason, thus said the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is therein. He compares Israel to precious metals burning in a pot with impurities that cannot be made pure. Sin cannot, sin, that the sins that you and I commit are not easily washed away. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. How many of you, how many of you as, 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 as a sinner can justify and be honest? that it's often difficult to overcome the stains and the memories of your indiscretions. I, I, I'll be honest, it's hard to, to, to overcome. <laughs> because you listen here, if nobody else knows know that you did it, <laughs> you do. And probably with the, the greatest test of a, of a Christian is where do you turn when your guilt and your sin is evident. Do you turn to good works? I just make up for it by how I live my life, by going to church, by reading my Bible, by, by preparing my offering. Is that how you make up for it? You ought to you understand that your sins have already been made up for it. You ought not look to your own works. Look to Christ's work. His body is broken for you. Israel is under this judgment. Bible calls them scum, impurities and metal that cannot be washed away. And God, by the fire, is trying to purify them. He says, I cannot purify them. That's a picture of us. Amen, somebody. 
Here's what I want you to see. Put your this, this is the key point. So take, take, take this away. Number one, Israel is occupying the land under the covenant works. That they are, they, they are in the land of Canaan based on their obedience. And the threat, if they should fail to obey, is that God would see great judgment upon them, that God would banish them from the, from the land of Canaan, and he would, he would destroy them, he would remove them from the land. We are not, as Christians, under a covenant of works. We are not in relationship with God bound by a law that we can break. We are in relationship with God because Christ, our mediator, is the one who lives for us, who accomplishes our righteousness for us. We are not in with him based on what, how we live. Israel was in that land based on their own obedience. And guess what? They failed to obey, and God sent real curses upon them. Again, I'll, I'll, that, that, that this judgment, this anger in the land of Jerusalem is, is, is an expression of God's enmity and hatred of sin. Amen. One of the hard things to get through in, in, in this culture and time is that God is constantly at odds with and opposed to sin. Well, you know, when we say, well, well, you know, God, uh, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. But he doesn't send the sin to hell. He sends the sinner to hell. Amen. God is opposed to sin. Here's the key point, that God judges us and is judging Israel according to what they have done. God judges according to our deeds. Look at Romans 2. Romans 2. You have it, say amen. Romans 2. You there? And it reads, who will render to every man according to his what? His deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish. Upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. God Judges us according to our deeds. Amen. Now you say, well, Pastor, that, that, that's just that's a re verse re reference to just the, the Jews and the Gentiles who are unsaved. Give me a verse for God where God is judging the deeds of Christians. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. When you have it, say amen. Five verse nine and ten. This is Paul talking. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of Him. For we, that must mean Christians, right? <laughs> must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether they, whether it be good or bad. God judges us according to the things that we do, according to our deeds. And likewise, in this text this morning, God is judging Israel according to their deeds. And somebody may be thinking, well, hey, well, hey that's a great thing, isn't it? That one day I'm going to have my day in court. And I'm going to be vindicated. That's a great thing, isn't it? Somebody thinking, you know what, people and my, my friends and my company, they have me, they have me pegged all wrong. But God knows my heart. And he knows I'm a good person. That's great, isn't it? That one day God's going to judge me according to my deeds. Because you know what? In the end, I want my own works. I want my works to speak for me. Beloved, that is not a great thing. The only way that it's going to be great to be judged according to your deeds is going to depend on where you stand. <laughs> whether, you, whether you're standing in the righteousness of Christ and your deeds are the fruit of uh, uh, an evidence of your faith in him 
or whether you're standing apart from Christ and your different deeds are an effort to win God's approval. Whatever side you stand on is going to determine whether it's going to be a pleasant day for you. But the only way that day is going to be great is if you're standing in the work of Christ for you. And your life is but a mere testimony of your, of your gratitude and your faith in God. Amen. How many know that 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 that, that works manifest your character and your character evidences your faith or lack thereof who you are as, as a Christian will, will show whether or not that your faith is truly in the Lord Christ or whether your faith is in this life or in this world are you hoping in through faith in Christ of, of the world to come where well, your life should bear fruit of that the evidence of that 1 John 3 and 3 says that he that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as Christ Jesus is pure and there's a body when your hope, your hope, your hope is through faith, you are somebody who wants to aim to please the Lord. That's the only kind of life that's consistent with faith. The, my, my, my hope is not in this world, not so much to please me. My hope in this life is to please Him. That's how I say, Pastor, we're not saved by works. And I, and I agree, we're not saved by works. Ephesians 2 8 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. We're not saved by our works. But the goal of our salvation is to produce works. Amen, somebody. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. We're not saved by our works. It says, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're not saved by our works, but we're saved unto good works. Amen. Because good works manifest who you are as a Christian, whether or not your faith is really in Christ. I'm not living, Lord, to do my will, Lord. I'm living to do your will. I'm living to please you. Amen. And we don't do that perfectly, do we? Come on, say amen. amen. Do we do it perfectly? Oh. Are we trying? Yeah. Yeah. Come on, don't fool me. <laughs> Are we trying? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be stumbling on our faces at times, falling on our faces. We're still trying. See, to be a Christian don't mean that I'm perfect. God, I'm not perfect in me. Amen, somebody. Amen. And, and, and I know I'm not perfect in me because my, my life from that day affirms that. Amen. That's why I don't seek a righteousness that's pure solely in me. I seek a righteousness that's in Christ alone. But here's the, here, here's the news. That when your hope is in his righteousness, he will charm away the unrighteousness in your own heart. Amen. Amen. I know the gospel has charm. Yes. The more that I fall in love with him and for what he did for me, then the more I loathe those things that offend him. Yes. You, 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 you ever had a person that you didn't care much for? Yes. Come on here. You ever been in love? Yes. Amen. Don't get quiet on me. Yes. Some of y'all not there yet. You, you're on your way. Amen, somebody. Yes. <laughs> you, there will come a day when things can be done to that individual, where you, if you don't have no emotional connection to them, you don't really, it don't really bother you. But let your heart get connect, connected to that person. And you watch how you respond to every violation of that individual. So that's what happens as we grow in our love for Christ. We grow in our disaffection and our hatred to those things that are affront to his majesty that are in affront to his glory. There are things in my Christian world, things I used to love, that I have grown over time to hate. It didn't happen overnight. Amen, somebody. It took some time, but the Lord, through his gospel and through his people, has been continually working in my heart. And that today I have some new lows and also some new loves. There's some things that used to bore me, now I get excited about, because I'm growing in my love, and I'm growing in my love. I'm growing in my affection. Amen. <laughs> That's real love. When you fall in love with somebody initially, a lot of it is biological. Amen, somebody. <laughs> I love Jaquay. I love biological. Amen, somebody. Amen. Something about her attracted me, and I wanted that girl. Amen, somebody. And I was thankful the Lord gave it to me. But in marriage, 
My love for her and affection has grown. Because as we live together, I've seen new sides of her that have increased my affection for her. When you go to church, you hear God's word, and you hear about Christ every single week, you should be seeing new sides of him that make you love him even more. And that's a body. That's what Christ people said. When you, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Well, how can you love him if you don't hear about him? You go to church every single week, we preach talking about uh, making you, showing you how to be debt free. We got sermons on how to be a good wife, how to be a good husband, how to be a good ch children, how to be a good friend. All those things are, are, are great, but they are unfruitful unless they point to Christ. Because I can preach to you principles all day, but you won't do it, do any laws, unless you fall in love with the lawgiver. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to fall in love with Jesus. And then you value what he says. Then you love what he commands. So every single week, the pastor's obligated to stand up here and to, and, and to show you the excellency and the sufficiency that we have in Christ, that you may fall in love with him and thereby be inspired and fueled to a life of holiness and righteousness. Amen, somebody. I think this is important here. This point is important for a number of reasons. One, it, it, it testifies to the evil of our the evil of our sin. God's punishment on Israel testifies to the great evil of our sin. Uh, when I was coming up, there was a preacher, great preacher in Dallas named C. W. Clark, Caesar Arthur Walter Clark. Well, he was one of the, picked by Ebony Magazine as one of the top, the, the number one preacher, black preacher of the last century. And I was, had the privilege as a young boy to go to his church and sit in his pews and listen to him. And I once heard him say that the sin of man is the grief of God. And he said in his own inimitable way, he would say, why? <laughs> why would anyone want to grieve God? God is kind. God is loving. God is merciful. Why would anyone want to grieve God? That just shows you how great our, how great the evil of sin is. And the greatest evil, the evil in our misdeeds do not lie, beloved, in the, 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 the disgrace they bring to us. Amen. It does not lie in the sorrow, sorrow or suffering it might bring to others. But the, our greatest, our evil lies in the fact that our evil constitutes a rebellion against God, who is our creator and Lord. Why is it wrong? Why is sin so bad? Because it's rebellion against God, who's our creator and Lord, the God who, 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 who made you, the God who chose the God who sent his son to die for you. It's rebellion against him. That's what makes us so ugly. And God is, is repulsed by us, and therefore he is bound, therefore, to bring judgment upon it. Because our sins are an affront to the God who created us. Can you imagine this? That we have the audacity, the unmitigated goal, to rebel and defy a God who, on whom our very life depends. That in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our very being. That in, at any moment God can take your breath like this and you'll be gone. Your life depends on him every single day, every single second. And not only that, but that this great God will send his only son into the world to pay the penalty for your sin. That you will rebel against that God. That you will refuse to turn from your sins and turn to Christ and be saved. It's a great evil, isn't it? It's a great evil. Not just God's anger visited upon his people. How Israel fanned the flames of God's anger. Israel would fan the flames of God's anger through her persistent, presumptuous sin. <laughs> Israel in Jerusalem was no average sinner. They were great sinners. Amen. 
Somebody said, I can be a great sinner. Well, there, there, there are people who are great sinners. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> there, there are people who are respectable sinners, and then there are great sinners. Israel was guilty of, 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 of grotesque and intense, audacious sinning. They sin with the high hand. They sin with the assumption that God is going to continue to forgive us and be merciful. He's going to continue to put up with it. He's going to forbear. He's going to be patient. He's not going. Nothing's going to happen to us. And they did that despite the continual prophetic warnings of God. The prophets continued to warn them, hey, judgment's coming. And they kept saying, no, it's not. God said that, 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 that this city is a cauldron and that we are like meat. We are safe on the inside of it. The prophets of Israel continue to lie and tell the people, y'all are okay, you're saying, guess what, the same thing is happening today. We have a bunch of false prophets and false preachers who, oh Lord. <laughs> Whoever tell me going to church, all they tell us is about a bunch of good stuff. Y'all like, hey, you're, you're great, everything is wonderful. And they won't tell you that the wrath of God is coming upon those who refuse to turn from their sin and put their faith in his son. They won't tell you that. Israel was in a, in a terrible state. And, 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 and note, note here, note, note the correlation between, between Israel's audacious sin and the open expression of God's anger. Look at verse number, uh, number, number seven. Ezekiel 24, are y'all there? Come on down to verse number seven. When you have to say amen. This is what it says. He says, Woe, well, wherefore thus saith the Lord God, woe to the bloody city, to that part whose scum is therein, whose scum is not gone out of it, bring it out piece by piece, let no fall upon it, for her blood is in the midst of her. She set it upon the top of rocks, she, she poured it not upon the ground to cover it with dust. Now the idea is this, that Israel was, Israel was committing gross injustices and violence, not at nighttime, but in the daytime. You can go to any city in the daytime. Amen, somebody. And no matter how, how picturesque that city may seem, in every city, city, there's always an underbelly, a hidden criminal part of it that you cannot see. Yeah. Well, Israel's crimes were not done at nighttime. Israel's crime was done before God in broad daylight. The Bible says that they were as an imperious whore, a whore who, who, who was shameless. I, 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 that, that, that astonishes me to, to, to go down uh, International Times in the daytime and see these young girls out there just pr prostituting in the daytime. Yeah. Out there in their underwear. How bold you gotta be? Yeah. Hey, man, I, I get it at nighttime because at nighttime you have some cover but in, the, in, in broad daylight. Well, that's how Israel sin was. They were, they, they were right before God's, God's face. They were thumbing their nose, their, their nose at him. Basically, Haunting him, saying, God, what are you going to do about it? And God said, I'll show you. I'll show you what I'm going to do about it. You keep doing it. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do about it. What has, what has kept Israel in this state? Look at verse number 12. Verse 24, verse 12, you're there? She hath wearied herself with lies. Y'all catch, catch that? What kept Israel from turning from their sin to, to, to God and embracing their God? She kept lying to herself. She believed the lies of the prophets. And there's somebody. And guess what, beloved? We don't have to necessarily hear the, hear the lies of the prophet. We have to be careful of the lies of our own heart. And we got to be careful of the lies we hear from this wicked and wretched culture that we live in today. Yeah. Amen. It used to be a day that they say, if you're, if you're, if you're running fools, you're going to be a fool. The way that which, which fool was foolishness came to us is we, through, our, through our relationships. Guess what? We don't need relationships anymore to be a fool. Yeah. All of these media outlets are a great source of channeling foolishness to, us, to people today. We believe the lies that we are told and we believe the lies of our own heart about who we are and who God is and we refuse to turn from our sins. Oh. 
they, 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 these men, these people willfully opposed the truth. Jeremiah had warned them, Ezekiel had warned them, and they kept saying to themselves, we're good. We're okay. Amen. And this was not a, a matter of a defect in judgment. This shows the perverseness of their will that is caused by the pride and the ambition of their own heart. They didn't want to go, and they, they, so they, they refused to believe what God said. I'm taking you out of this land. I'm putting you in bondage for seven years. They said, no, that's not going to ever happen. This is a real instance, church, of resistance. Look at verse number 13. He says, In thy filthiness is lewdness, because I, I have purged thee, and thou wast not purged. Look, this is what God says. I tried to purify you. I tried to cleanse you. How? Through the prophet's warnings. And it says this. You refuse to be cleansed. This is a real instance of of rejecting God's gracious overtures. God tried to get the people to turn them, turn from sin, that he may preserve their life. Now what does it prove? Does it prove that man has a free will and can do whatever he wants to do? No, it only, only proves that man needs the grace of God to change his heart about God that he may do God's will. How many of you need God's grace? We are in desperate need of the grace of a new covenant. We need the, the spirit to come into our hearts to help us loathe our sinfulness and eschew our righteousness and embrace the righteousness of God in Christ. We need that grace. And we will not do it on our own. We need God to give us a new heart. We need God to take out of us a heart of stone and give us a tender heart. What do you mean by that? A heart that is sensitive to his message. A heart that is sensitive to his gospel. We don't turn from our sin on our own. We don't obey God. We don't follow Christ on our own. God must first what? Change our hearts. How many of you follow Christ today? Yeah. Raise your hand high today. How many of you follow Christ today? Well, let me say this. It wasn't because you got smart. It wasn't because you were so hip, you were wiser than everybody else, or because you were so righteous. It's because God has been gracious to you to open up your heart to help you see your need for salvation. To see your failure under the law and to see how in Christ Jesus, he has given you all things to have a relationship with him. Apostasy is true indeed a, a defect of the heart. Not just a defect in judgment. It's the perverseness of the will that's fueled by pride and ambition. Amen. So we oppose the truth because of the ignorance of our mind, the pride of our own hearts and the prejudice of our education. We will stand against the truth knowing that it's the truth. We'll still say, I, I don't believe. And God is telling you, you need to be saved today. Yeah. Amen. God is showing you that your salvation that can't be in you, it has to be in Christ. If you refuse that, it's only because your heart is perverse. Because why would you reject a way of salvation? Yeah. God is trying to deliver you. Amen, somebody. God's going to send people to hell. Well, God, how can I love a God who sent, sent people to hell? Well, he, he gave you a way out of hell. Yeah. Through his son. I'm done. Here's my final point. Look at verse number 13, the B part. Thou shalt not be purged from thy filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon thee. The prophet holds forth hope for Israel after judgment. So you guys are going to find you won't be cleansed until after my judgment and wrath has come to rest upon you. See, God's sin demands that somebody die. Sin demands that somebody must die. All die. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. See, we debate capital punishment. Whether or not it is a just, a, 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 whether it has legal grounds for it. Amen, somebody. But in God's eyes, it's a no-brainer. We debate whether or not somebody, a man has a right to take another man's life. We debate it in some ways, because when it comes to abortion, we don't debate that. We claim a woman has a right. Yeah. Woman ain't had no right. <laughs> but God has every right. 
to take your life for when you violate his laws because he is, he is your sovereign. He is your Lord. Amen, somebody. He has a right to take everything. He is the absolute owner. He is the final disposer of all things. The Lord giveth. The Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's his life to give, but it's also his life to take. And God says, I won't be at peace with you again. I won't restore your first your fortunes until my wrath and my fury has come to rest on your head. When God has spent all of his wrath on his nation, then he, after that destruction, will be made propitious toward those who, those who, the other Jews will be gathered back into the nation again, into to that land. He'll be made propitious. And beloved, I want you to know this today. That we are made propitious with God Amen. by the blood of his son. Amen. He is the propitiator. <laughs> it is the virtue of his sacrifice. It is his blood that is sacrificed for us through which God has made peaceable to us a wicked and wretched people. Amen. And how many of you glad this morning about that? Amen. 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 Now if you're glad, you ought to show it. Remember that song is coming up. If you're happy, you know it. <laughs> clap your hands. If you're clapping, you know it. Stomp your feet. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. If you're happy and you know it, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, our God, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for your propitious power. We see, Lord, that we are deserving of your wrath and your curse. But you've caused all of that to rest upon, not us, but on your son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Help us, Lord, in light of that, not to, to take it for granted, but to do all that we can in our own life to be thoroughgoing Christians. We ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen.